As you may know and recall, since Putin's second invasion of Ukraine began, the United States and its NATO allies have provided a great deal of aid and weaponry to Ukraine. I'm here now with Ambassador Oksana Markarova from the Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian Ambassador of the United States. Madam Ambassador, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for joining me. Good morning, Hugh. Thank you for having me. I want to start with the most important question. What does Ukraine need in terms of weaponry the most from the United States right now? Well, Hugh, that's a difficult and easy question at the same time, because uh, the right answer would be to say everything. Uh, of uh -huh. course, we are fighting for 768 days an enemy, which is so much bigger than us. So uh, from air defense to artillery to everything that is becoming scarce, as we see, and Russia intensifies the attacks, uh, we, we need all the support that we can get. And yet, even with without additional support for months now, Ukraine is not only holding a very long line, but also continues to destroy the Russian Black Sea Fleet and continues to attack Russia's oil refineries and other uh, war-related, directly war-related objects with our own capabilities. But of course, in order to win faster, in order to liberate people who suffer on the territories which Russia still control, we need additional support and uh, there is a range of capabilities that we lack. When you say everything, I know that that is the correct answer, but let's drill down a bit and start specifically. I know you're trying to get patriots from Raytheon. Does that look like it's going to happen? Well, you know, with air defense, it's essential part of being able to continue the effort because not only Russia fights on the front line, we know that on a daily basis they do these attacks with Iranian-built Shahid drones, with North Korean-built uh, missiles and Russian missiles everywhere in Ukraine. Odessa is under uh, constant pressure. Uh, Kiev is being hit by missiles. Uh, Kharkiv, Dnipro, uh, so many hospitals, residential areas are pounded on a daily basis. So air defense is key. And of course, patriots have shown uh, unbelievable uh you know results with ukrainian defenders using them in the very effective way not only they are taking down everything that we thought they could but including the russia's so-called supersonic uh, missile so yes you know more interceptors and more patriot and patriot type capabilities uh we're also receiving some from from european colleagues you know irsts and others nothing of course can compare to Patriots. But yes, we need them uh, as many as our partners can provide. Now, is the hold up there Congress or is the hold up there Raytheon? Because I, I can't believe any member of Congress would be opposed to selling you more Patriots because uh, seeing the pictures of the apartment buildings and the civilian casualties, everybody knows Russia is waging a war crime driven war. And that's not in doubt. And Patriots stop war crimes from happening. So is the bottleneck Raytheon or is it Congress? Well, uh, Hugh, there is a number of challenges we have to resolve in order to be able to get more. Of course, we all pray and hope Congress will support uh, additional appropriations. This is this is needed in order for Pentagon to be able to continue providing it. Uh, but even when we had this generously provided by Congress for supplementary funds in the past, uh, it's not the only uh, thing that we need in order to get it. You're absolutely right. The production in all the countries, all the peaceful countries, uh, where we were not preparing for war, uh, is not where we needed to be in order to be able to, to counter an enemy like Russia. That's why we're not only asking American companies to help or the Congress to help, but we're working really hard on co-production and working with a number of American companies to start production, at least some components, if not the whole capabilities in Ukraine, so that we can defend us, but also defend other friends and allies. So it's there, there is a lot of challenges which we have to overcome, but we have to do it in order to win. How much time of your day, Madam Ambassador, do you spend talking to legislators and how much time of your day do you spend talking to executive branch and then to contractors? There are three, three buckets, Congress people, executive branch people, DOD and the White House, and then defense contractors. How does your day divide up? And then there are knuckleheads like me who are on media. Hugh, it feels like uh, I'm talking 24-7 to all three of them. And it's sometimes it's uh, more in, in, <clears throat> in uh, some areas and sometimes in others. But I'm so happy to be doing what I'm doing with you now, 
uh, talking to American people because we were able to, to, to be where we are and to win because American people support us. And it's so important for American people to understand why it is important for all of us to win, why we have to stay the course now when Russia is uniting forces with North Korea, Iran, Hamas, <coughs> we have to show that we are stronger. Two of my closest friends, for the benefit of the audience, Dan Poneman, who I've known for 50 years, and Dan Rundy, who I've known since I got to D.C., they're both on the Democrat and the Republican side. They said, they got to talk to this ambassador. I got to talk to you because you make the case. So tell me, are you an optimist? You've been in D.C. since 2021. You've been doing the, the diplomatic effort for many years. You're also a Hoosier. You're an honorary Hoosier. You're an IU grad. So are and you an optimist one. as well? Yeah, they're not making it to the final four this year, Madam Ambassador. Sorry about that. But are you an optimist about the war? You really have to do that and say that about the final, you know. Um, I am devoted Hoosier. So, uh, look, I have to be an optimist, uh, as all Ukrainians, from President Zelensky to people on the front line to people everywhere in Kiev, Bucha, or Kharkiv, or Odessa. Uh, you know, it's existential for us to defend ourselves. We're defending our homes, our loved ones, but we're also defending the freedom and democracy, something on which this country is built on. And, uh, you know, Let's look back, you know, during these two years, very difficult two years, we suffered a lot, we lost a lot. But uh, what we were able to do together with the support of our friends is nothing short of a miracle, you know. Uh, not only Russia did not take us in three uh, days or three weeks, uh, not only we liberated 50% of the territories and frankly destroyed or damaged more than a third now of Russian Black Sea fleet. Uh, not only we are holding a very long 800 miles line of front, being so much smaller in size and, and defense capabilities, but we are also sending a resounding message to all the autocrats that it's not okay in the 21st century to redraw the borders by brutal force or to conduct genocides against a peaceful neighbor. And, you know, I my you said I'm a Hoosier. I felt myself at home in Indiana because... Uh, partially probably because my mom comes from a farmer's community and uh wow. you know when 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 you live on the uh, when you live uh, uh and you you're part of the farmer's community when something happens to another farmer you go and help it, and it doesn't matter whether it's a farmer who's your neighbor right next to you or someone who you never ne met in in other village you know and and this is what it is about uh, we are so much like americans we believe in the same values we want to live peacefully, just raise our kids, you know, raise food, grow food. And uh, we were never a threat to Russia or to anyone. It's the you know, 25 that years ago, Madam Ambassador, 25 years ago, my daughter went on two mission trips to Kiev after the fall of the Soviet Union, after Ukraine. And it was it was getting up on its feet. It was beginning to stand up. There was organized crime. There were problems when you were before the first invasion and certainly before the second invasion. What did you foresee as the future of Ukraine? Because she saw a pretty remarkable country 25 years ago. I haven't been there. Uh, so tell me, was it on a trajectory that you thought would bring it into the top 20 economies in the world? Absolutely, Hugh. You know, in 2013, when Russia attacked us, we got to peaceful <laughs> accords. We started reforming our country. That's when I joined the government. And, you know, we started building Ukraine, which is, uh, modern, innovative, European, free of corruption, future member of European Union and NATO, everything that we believed in, uh, we were firmly on the path of becoming uh, one of the fastest growing economies in Eastern Europe. That's why Putin attacked us, because he didn't want a democratic, peaceful, prosperous example for his own people right next to him. That's the only reason we were never threat. And I am positive that after we win, and we have to win together, we will come back uh, on, on this path, and the reconstruction of Ukraine will allow us to leapfrog into this Ukraine 2.0, which is not only going to be good for Ukrainians, but it's going to be a solution in energy, agriculture, food security, digital, and, and uh, everything else, part of the solution to global challenges and, and the reliable partner to the United States. Before the war, Ukraine, we're going to take a break in two minutes, Madam uh, Ambassador, then we'll come back. Before the war, Ukraine was feeding the world. It was the world's breadbasket. It has always been the world's breadbasket. If anyone knows anything about wheat and other grains, they come from Ukraine in a large percentage. 
Has that gotten back to pre-war capacity yet, or is it still limited? Well, right after, with our own capabilities, we restored the grain corridor, and not on the grain corridor, we again are feeding the world. But yes, Russia tried to block it by blocking the Black Sea, and there was a big problem during the first two years of war. Now, thanks to our brave defenders, we're back, and we're sending. Of course, it's not where it used to be. Ukraine used to be in top five of all major products, uh, including sunflower oil, we were number one, and uh, grain, different types of grain. But we are on the trajectory to do that. Now we need a little bit more air defense and other capabilities in order to be able to have that in a sustainable manner. Yeah, you know, we have one minute left to the break and then we'll come back, Matter, You mentioned air defense again. To me, that's the number one thing. And that's why I brought up Patriots so early. If you can't defend your people, it's very hard to run anything. How many Patriot batteries or other air defense batteries are there now deployed around the country in, in rough terms? Well, that's something I cannot uh, tell you as the number, but I can tell you not enough. You know, we need more air defense to protect everywhere in Ukraine and especially uh, not only residential areas, but also those areas which are very important for export production, food security, and everything else. Talking with Ambassador Marka Rova, she is Ukraine's ambassador to the United States. Madam Ambassador, our friend Dan Rundy has told me that in Russia-occupied Ukraine, there are a number of religious minorities, Baptists, Adventists, Roman Catholics like me, who are being brutalized by the Russians. Is that true? And if so, how do we, how do we help those people? I wouldn't even call them minorities. You know, Ukraine uh, has a great diversity among Christians, and we pretty much have uh, a number of evangelical and Protestant Baptist churches in addition to Orthodox Catholics, Greek Catholics that we have in Ukraine. And it all flourishes, and we all live peacefully and pray together, whereas Russia prohibits specifically, uh, sometimes it's for all Christians, sometimes they criminalize some particular churches, but the horrifying stories that we hear from Ukrainian Baptists, from Ukrainian Catholics, from Ukrainian Orthodox on the territories where Russia still uh, illegally occupies them is horrifying. They specifically target priests. They prohibit people to gather in churches. They destroy churches. We now have already uh, a big map of the religious uh, uh, places destroyed by, by the Russians, and it's not a collateral damage. They have been targeted specifically. So there is big threat to religious freedom, not only on the con uh, controlled by Russia territories, but in general in Russia. We know how many Christian churches are prohibited in Russia. We have seen it during two year, 10 years in Crimea. So it's, it's a pattern that we see all, over and over again. So, Madam Ambassador, I also, uh, among the many war crimes that Putin has committed against Ukraine, they have kidnapped, th kidnapped thousands of Ukrainian children. Do you know where they are? Do they, do they try and communicate some way? What has happened to these children? Hugh, you know, the prosecutor general already regi registered more than 128,000 individual war crime cases, which they're investigating and prosecuting. Wow. Uh, you're absolutely right. The most horrific of them is the kidnapping of Ukrainian children. Uh, we have at least 20,000 cases registered that we know of uh, kids that have been abducted by Russians. Russians themselves brag about 700,000. Uh, the problem is because they do not share any information with us, because we do not know what happened to so many children from Mariupol and other places which Russia still occupies, uh, it's, it's, it's a crime where I think we don't see the magnitude even yet. But as you know, one child abducted is one too many. And they are taking them and putting them for speedy adoptions into Russian families. They are putting teenagers through this re-educational camps, which is horrible. It's a torture camps for Ukrainian youth where they are forced to not only speak Russian, but deny that they're Ukrainians. They've been uh, brutally, physically and emotionally abused. Why do we know all of that? Because we have freed already more than 300 of them. Yes, uh, not, not enough, but uh, we have had their accounts. Uh, they're testifying in Ukraine. They testified in Congress uh, in front of the Helsinki Commission. So it's a horrible crime for which Putin personally is indicted by the ICC, International Criminal Court. And there is a global arrest warrant for him personally and for his so-called uh, children's ombudsman, Lvova Bilova, who abducted a child herself. 
this is something that has to be punished. Everyone has to be held on the account. And look, Putin is a war criminal on so many accounts. But as the mother, I think this is the one uh, where, where which will land him in on the bench in The Hague and, and in prison. A last question, Madam Ambassador. I keep urging my Republican friends to support weapons for Ukraine if they can't bring themselves for the full aid package. I'd like all the aid package, but I'll take the weapons. What's the best thing the audience can do to help persuade American legislators left, right, and center that Ukraine needs to get this, this aid now? Well, first of all, uh, I, I think right now we just need everyone who support us uh, to, to make it... Uh, uh, public, you know, uh, write to your congressmen or senators, uh, call them, tell them that you support us. When Americans put our flags outside of your houses, and I know how important and valuable and precious flags, American flags for Americans are, this is a direct message to anyone who sees it, that American people are with us and that they support this fight. And they understand that this fight is not just the fight for Ukraine. It's a fight for all of us. It's a fight for democracy and freedom. It's a fight for values in which we believe, and it's important. Uh, it's a fight for what President Reagan uh, called, you know, a fight for the Americans and that America will never, uh, you know, uh, break face with those who fight for the same values, regardless of where it is. Uh, this well, is you know how to get to me. I'm old enough to have worked for the man, so you're right, Ambassador. It is nice to meet you virtually. I look forward to meeting you in person. Thank you for spending time with me. Got you up early this morning, but Ambassador Marco Arova, thank you so much. We will continue to put, ask Speaker Johnson to move this package quickly and get it back to the White House for President Biden's signature so we can continue to stand with Ukraine, which is really the only right, justifiable, moral, American thing to do, and we got to keep doing it. Thank you, Ambassador Marco Arova.